Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us for this AHDB webinar presenting some protected buying crops industry highlights. I'm Natalie Key, Knowledge Exchange Manager for AHDB Horticulture and I'll be facilitating the session today. And we have a varied programme for you today sharing outcomes and information from both AHDB funded and other research and development projects which reflect the range of work going on uh, for the protected vine crops industry at the moment. Before we kick off, uh, just to run through some housekeeping elements and then the order of play for the webinar. So for information throughout the webinar, um, the audience is muted and you can submit questions anonymously via the questions box um, on the right hand side of your screen in the panel. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions after each presentation and also at the end of the sessions and I'll be reading those out to the speakers. It would be helpful if you could um, indicate who the question is for. Any questions we don't get to will be saved and answered after the webinar where possible um, and if once we're finished there are further questions please do email them to me on natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk. You can access handouts via the right hand panel as well and um, BASIS and Enroso are available to claim. If, if you did not submit your details um, when you registered, you can send them via the questions box now or email them um, to either Aaron, my um, colleague in events, or myself. Um, the webinar will also be recorded and made available on the web pages shortly. Where possible during the webinar, um, presenters' webcams will be on, but where there are technical issues or for sound quality, webcams will be turned off. So just um, for an overview of what to expect from our presenters today. In this first session running until about 12.30, we'll start off with Adrian Fox from Ferris Science, who will discuss the management of contact transmissible viruses, including um, the background to key pathogens of protective vine crops, common issues and mitigation of risk, whilst also drawing in some specific, uh, the specific example of tomato brown ghost fruit virus and outcomes from some of the ongoing work he has been leading on the survival and disinfection of this virus and its spread and detection. Um, continuing along a similar theme, Dave Kay from ADAS will discuss his work reviewing the hygiene measures implemented by protected edible growers to prevent pest and disease outbreaks. Um, and the gaps and obstacles to employing best practice. Um, with that in mind, he will highlight some of the pra practical learnings from the tomato brown ghost fruit virus case studies um, he did with UK growers who experienced an outbreak. We'll then um, hear from Dave Chandler from Warwick Crop Centre, who will provide an update on the current research project looking at the pollination performance of the native bumblebee and tomato crops and how it could be improved. And to finish off this first session, John Swain from NFU Energy um, will build on the recent webinar and podcast he has delivered with us on the topic of net zero, looking more specifically at reducing carbon emissions from energy requirements, particularly in the context of um, electricity grid decarbonisation and reduced support for new renewable heat. Um, after a lunch break, we will start session two at 1pm and we will hear from Neil Fedden about lean management, AHGB's Joe McTighe um, will provide a protected vine crops crop protection update and Ant Surridge from Fargo will discuss the effective management of bioprotectants in IPM programmes but um, I will provide a brief introduction to those by following the break. So as I think that's all I need to say for now I will um, pass over to Adrian to kick us off. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. We can see that. OK, good morning. Um, so for those that don't know me, my name is Adrian Fox and I'm the lead virologist at Ferro Science Limited in York. And Ferro Science is the national reference laboratory for plant health in England and Wales. So this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about management of contact transmissible viruses and viroids. Um, hopefully I won't tread on Dave's toes who's coming after me too much 
uh, what I want to do is take some of the learning that we've had from years of working on things like pospiviroids um, and also recently tobamoviruses, which I'll talk about in tomatoes, um, and how we can apply that learning acro across vine crops on a, on a more generic level. So with the contact transmissible viruses that we'll be talking about, um, of most immediate concern at the moment are a group of viruses called the Tabamo viruses, um, and these are a persistent problem for glasshouse growers. So the, the, the ones we've known the most about for longest are tobacco mosaic and tomato mosaic, but there's a couple of new kids on the block, so tomato brown with those fruit virus and tomato mottle mosaic virus, um, and then some um, issues that will affect other crops as well. So brown goes fruit, we know we're going to pepper, but there's also a persistent issue with pepper mild mottle virus and also in cucumbers, cucumber green mottle mosaic virus. And I'll also talk a little bit about viroids as well. Um, and just discuss what we can do about this issue. So a little bit about hygiene best practice, but also some of the work we've been doing to try and better understand how we can detect and control the, these viruses better. And I'll say, wherever possible, I'll talk at a general level, but there will be some specifics as we go through. So tobacco viruses, uh, the genus of virus is named after the type measure tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and this has been known about, it was really the first plant virus we actually knew about, and it's been known, known about since the eight, mid 1800s. Um, it's envir environmentally robust. And the members of this genus are contact transmitted and they're seed borne. And really across all of the contact transmissible pathogens, whether they're viruses or not, that these this seedborne aspect is something that's a major concern. And that may be true seedborne transmission where the pathogen is within the seed coat, or it may be seed coat contamination. But as we'll see as we go through, because these things are so robust, getting rid of them on the seed coat can also present a challenge as well. Um, the main viruses of concern, so tobacco and tomato mosaic virus are generally controlled through plant resistance. Um, and in tomato, you've got the TM22 resistance. In, in pepper, there's a suite of resistance alleles, uh, resistance genes that help protect against these viruses. However, some of the, the, the newer viruses we worry about overcome this resistance. And the, this group of viruses also include major viruses infecting pepper and cucumber as well. So tomato brown goes fruit virus, which is pretty much the virus that's sucked up most of the last couple of years of my life. Um, it's become a major problem because viruses can overcome the, the TMV resistance genes in tomato. Um, and there have also been records on pepper in Mexico and Sicily. And what we do know is some of the, the pepper resistance genes will hold up against brown rugose fruit virus. However, some of them don't. And what we don't have is a clear picture of which varieties are resistant and which aren't. And so this outbreak in Sicily that I've highlighted within the, the text here uh, was a reinfection from a previous tomato crop. They cleared the tomato crop out because it was infected with brown rugose fruit virus, planted a pepper crop, and that became infected as well. As with all viruses, once the plants are infected, they can't be cured. So this really is a situation where prevention is a, a much better route to take. Um, as with all of these, it's spread through mechanical contact. So that's direct plant to plant contact, transmission on tools, clothing, bumblebees. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. And once the, the virus takes hold in a crop, it can spread rapidly. And quite often before you've even seen symptoms, you've got a, a, a widespread infection within your crop. Uh, we know we can detect it before you can see symptoms, and then later on, sometimes related to stress conditions, the virus will start to show itself, and that's when the damage is done. Uh, seed transmission has now been demonstrated, and there are a couple of papers looking at disinfection of seed, but we know that this is a major route for transmission, and really that's how the virus has managed within the space of five years to, to distribute itself into all the major growing tomato growing regions of the world. And so good hygiene measures can minimize spread and limit impact should an outbreak occur. Overview of symptoms, um, within the laboratory, uh, we, we, we call these things virusy looking. Um, and you've got certain indicative symptoms that we'll see on the next few slides as we talk about different viruses, which are really um, highlight the, those, those virusy type symptoms. So here you've got yellowing, um, can I use a, a pointer? Let's, let's go up a level. So we've got the, the yellowing symptoms here. You've got some 
defamation of leaves, you've got bubbling. And then once you get fruit formation, you get uneven ripening and, and yellowing, uh, patchiness. And then for tomato brown and those fruit virus, you may also get this indicative symptom, which, um, which is where the name for the virus comes from. However, this is actually quite unusual in our experience. So I think if you're in hotter climates where the virus was first reported in places like Israel, you may see this more frequently. However, in our part of the world, it tends to be more the, the discolored fruit if you see a symptom at all. As I said, the virus can also infect pepper and where we know that the, uh, we've had pepper infections, there's in early infections, there's a report, reports of, of necrosis on leaves, uh, reports of bubbling and leaf defamation, and again, uneven ripening and necrosis on fruit as well. As I said, this is the, the new kid on the block. It emerged about the same time as brown ghost fruit virus, but TOMMV doesn't seem to have spread at the same rate as brown ghost fruit virus. However, it does share the characteristics that it's um, it's, it overcomes some of those resistance genes and also um, it, it's seed transmitted and we know that we've intercepted it in seed lots both here and in the Netherlands so it's one that we're always on the lookout for. Thankfully as I said we haven't got the same level of outbreaks as we have with brown and fruit virus however most of the diagnostics we use will actually pick up mottle mosaic as well as brown and fruit virus. And other tobacco viruses that go around, cucumber green mottle mosaic virus, again, this yellowing and, and discoloration on fruit is indicative of infection, um, and pepper mild mottle virus, which again could also give you this kind of bumpy fruit symptom, so you get defamation um, and reduce the, the quality of your fruit. And certainly something like pepper mild mottle virus around the world is one of the more common viruses that's, that's found in pepper crops. Um, and touch wood, we don't have a major issue with it here, but it's one to be aware of. One of the key things to remember across all the vining crops is that the contact transmissible viruses may look similar to other uh, insect transmitted viruses. So thinking about tomato spotted wilt, our old friend, which can be an issue across all of these crops spread by thrips. Um, and here you can see it, you've also got this discoloration. So it, it it can look quite similar, especially um, if, if your eye isn't quite in for spotting these things. And the, the potty viruses, so this is another group of viruses which are spread by aphids, um, difficult to control due to rapid spread. And we know that they're currently an issue in importing certainly chilies from several regions around the world with a suite of these potty viruses. So if you're seeing these kind of symptoms, especially if you're in the pack house, as we'll discuss in a moment, it may be wise to actually get a diagnostic done and just see whether it's one of these insect transmitted viruses, which may lower the risk to the rest of your crop. However, it's good to be aware of what you're actually dealing with. And the other one is viroids. Touch wood, we haven't had an issue with viroids for a few years in the UK, but the main viroids of concern, the Hospi viroids, so potato spindle tuber, tomato crushing dwarf, columnar latent, and pepper chap fruit. We know go on to tomato, pepper, and other solanaceous crops uh, with differing levels of impact, but certainly on tomato, this kind of closed up internodes, yellowing, twisting, and in extreme cases, necrosis is quite indicative of infection. And this more recently um, discovered pepper chap fruit viroid again causes dwarfing of plants and can give you reduced fruit size. And there's also a, a viroid that we haven't seen in cucumber for, for many, many years. It used to be called cucumber pale fruit viroid. We now know that it is a viral called hop stumped. So just things to be aware of. So in terms of spread of contact transmissible viruses, um, you've got to think about how these things get into the glasshouse in the first place. So via propagation plants, likely from infected seed, um, via contaminated fruit going through the pack house that is, is then picked up on staff and moved into the, the crop or via contamination on staff so infected fruit off site and then once it's in the glass house you've got to think about how it moves around that glass house so thinking about movement of staff on clothes skin and hair uh, movement of equipment such as trolleys and crates and also these things can usually move on bumblebees during pollination, and we know that they can move around the glasshouse and recirculate irrigation water. So all of these are points of concern. 
So under PEO33, to look at tomato brown ghost fruit virus specifically, we looked at how long these viruses can survive on different glasshouse surfaces. And what we found was that these things can survive for at least seven days across the whole suite of glasshouse surfaces. And on many surfaces, even up to six months, you can still have viable infection. So it's really key to make sure that you, if at all possible, you don't get infection into your glasshouse. And if you do, that your uh, hygiene measures and uh, prophylactic precautions are up to scratch to make sure that you don't get spread within the glasshouse. As part of that project, we've also looked at potential risk points, so things like the seed coming in, um, visitors, workers in the canteen and the pack house, and also movement within the glasshouse as potential risk points for consideration. So if we focus on those hygiene best practices, as I said, as with many other things in life, prophylactic control can prevent years of heartache and, and, and expensive problems. Um, but I think it's important to note that these things are generic across all of these pathogens. And, and this list was actually formulated for control of pospiviroids, but we can easily apply it to all of the other contract transmissible pathogens. So restricting access to the place of production, really, if, if people don't need to be in your glass house, don't let them into the glass house, especially people who are likely to have visited several other sites as well. So thinking about, you know, it, it's inevitable you may have to have contractors on site, but do you have to have uh, sales reps and things in? And train staff that they can spot symptoms early, but they also know what they're doing and why they're observing the, these precautions. And there's some information on the HTB Knowledge Bank ab about that you can use for, the, for training staff. Uh, limit movement of staff between facilities. So if you then get a problem in one glass house, it doesn't move elsewhere um, in your facility. Um, and the other thing is prohibit sourcing and packing of produce from other locations. I appreciate in the real world, this isn't possible. But as a, as a source where you can bring in infection from an external area, it, it's key to think about how you can minimize the risk of any contamination then moving into your pack house. So again, think about how your staff are moving around site. And the other thing is prohibit consumption of susceptible hosts on premises. So don't allow people to bring their own peppers, tomatoes, whatever, that may then be a source of contamination they can take into the glass house. We're recommending use of disposable gloves. Um, that's because in our work on, um, on tomato brown ghost fruit virus, we've shown that routine hand washing is of limited efficacy against brown ghost fruit virus. However, it's key to note that it will be useful against other contact transmissible pathogens, so it should be included within protocols. However, for brown ghost fruit virus specifically and other tobacco viruses, that hand washing will, will be of limited use. Um, think about using disposable clothes and overshoes or make sure that clothing is only used within a glass house or a zone of a glass house and this will then prevent accidental contamination on that clothing moving around the glass house and acting as a source of, of infection for other, other, uh, other plants around the glass house. I've put a question mark by foot dips. Um, as we'll see when I come onto the slide about disinfection in a moment, there'll, there'll be a question there about whether foot dips give exposure to virus long enough to actually be effective, especially when we're thinking about the tobacco viruses. Zonal working, that's just thinking about how staff are limited to movement around a facility to make sure that you don't get inadvertent contamination and cleaning and disinfection of equipment and tools as a prophylactic measure. And so the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we've done on disinfection efficacy. So this is purely looking at tomato brown and ghost fruit virus. And remember that we're not saying this is a control for tomato brown and ghost fruit virus. We're saying this is uh, whether a disinfectant is uh, efficacious against tomato brown and ghost fruit virus for use in general hygiene and, and cleanup procedures. And what we found is that concrete is quite problematic in terms of how we clean it up. But by that point, you've got a problem anyway. It's already in your glass house. So think about what's effective on these other surfaces as well. So Vercon S looks to have good efficacy generally as does Huasan, um, and that's at the, the stronger, um, the, the foaming level rather than the direct contact level. Um, and we found that Unifect G seems to be effective across the whole suite. This work isn't quite finished. We've got a few reps looking at, at longer and shorter contact times to, to just clear up 
any of the, the questions we've got around disinfectants. And the other thing that we're currently working on in PO 34 is looking at detection and spread of the virus. So if you do find a problem, what's the best part of the plant to sample for testing? And also, uh, what's our level of confidence that we'll find the virus if it's there? And here you'll see from our early work that at the upper part of the plant, so looking at return on piccolo and tomato, uh, we're getting detectable levels of virus after um, about 10 to 12 days after um, point of inoculation. If you sample from the middle of the plant, you're looking at about another week's delay to be able to get that level of detection. And if you sample from the, the bottom end of the plant, you could actually be up to three weeks before you can get the same level of detection from focusing on the top of that plant. So that may not be true for all of the, the pathogens we've talked about, but it's just one of those things that if you sample, sample from across the plant, don't just take the, the, the bottom leaves. And so the work we're doing, again, if you look at the HDB Knowledge Bank, you'll find work that relates to um, this kind of site-wide risk assessment. Um, and what we're doing is saying, well, actually, there are areas we can control through mechanical means and, and engineer solutions, uh, whether that be just stopping people moving or looking at how we change things. But inevitably, there are bits that we can't control. And so thinking about pollination activity and cutting, which is inevitable, and thinking that yeah, eventually staff have to eat something, so you, you can't prohibit that entirely. So looking at how you can just uh, best control and, and look to mitigate against the risks of, of that aspect of, of, of your operation to prevent incoming transmission or limit spread should it occur. So in summary, uh, contact transmittable virus pathogens tend to be robust, environmentally stable, and therefore present a challenge to manage. There are no 100% effective measures. Um, I don't know if anyone from COVID has seen the Swiss cheese analogy for protection, but you can think about this in the same way. There are no 100% effective measures, so each measure will have some efficacy and by stacking measures together, we can get better control. So an, an integrated suite of measures, some things are better than nothing, some things together give even better control, but there's no right or wrong answer, just do what you can. Um, and as generic measures, these should give some mitigation against all contact transmissible pathogens. And if possible, act like you have an outbreak. Remember what we say about prophylactic control. Um, those measures can minimize the risk of an outbreak in your crop and also mitigate against the spread should an outbreak occur. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so I will. Um, um, what do you think are the potential implications um, of the results so far from your work on the tomato brown rugose fruit virus spread and detection um, in terms of PHSI surveillance and sampling methods? OK, so that information, although we're only part way through, that information on best place to sample is being fed back to the PHSI and then being used within their uh, sampling protocols for the season as, as we go forward. Obviously, there are some practical implications, um, especially when you get into a, a more mature crop, um, getting to the, the top of, of, of a vine crop that maybe several metres off the ground isn't the most straightforward. Um, but inspectors are aware of this and also aware of the impact that that can have on the testing further downstream should uh, samples be taken from a, a less than ideal point in the plant. So generally speaking, as I said, that, that information has been fed back, it's been included in SOPs, but as ever, once an inspector gets on the ground, it's quite difficult to have a, a blanket instruction and things will, will, will be taken um, into account once they actually get on, on site and, and some flexibility will be allowed. Thank you. Um, I guess on, on a say, similar vein, you're saying you're halfway through or partway through that project at the moment. So what what else is um, being carried out within the spread and detection? OK, trials? so um, we're, at the moment, we're just catching up on testing with the second half of that first trial. So the first trial, we looked at early season uh, inoculation so so trying to mimic what would happen if you brought infection into your crop with a new plants or you certainly got infection very early on in the cropping cycle um, what we also are doing is trying to simulate what would happen if 
um, infection came in partway through the cropping cycle. And I wouldn't expect to see, to see the same pattern of distribution in the plant uh, based on previous work. I would expect it to be a bit more erratic. So that will be quite telling. Um, and I think as of 1st of April, we move into our repeat trial. So we're doing all that work again over the next several months to make sure that um, conditions in a winter crop aren't different from those in a, a, a spring summer crop. Um, but I, I would expect to see similar results to our first trial, certainly for that early point of infection. I think that the teller will be what happens with a mid-season infection. Um, and we're also we're developing quite an extensive image library. So we've got a photographer going in, um, certainly on a weekly basis and taking pictures of symptoms as they develop. I think we're above 700 photos now for the, the first part of the trial. So at some point, someone's going to have to sit down and try and align all of those to the different um, test points so that we can line up uh, what the different symptoms look like. Again, I'm always wary because we are in an artificial inoculation situation. So it's not a true commercial crop situation. Uh, we've, we've mimicked commercial growing conditions as best we can. But effectively, this has been done in a, a quarantine glass house, so we can't mimic what happens on um, yeah, hectares of, of glass. Yeah, and, and as you say, um, any of the, of the outcomes or learnings that you, you achieve will be shared throughout, won't they, with the yeah. PHSI and relevant parties to make sure yeah, and that... Also, sorry, go on. No, just to make sure that, um, you know, <laughs> those protocols are as uh, appropriate to growers as possible. Yeah, and also those results are being fed back to industry in real time through the Tomato Brown Ghost Root Virus Steering Group that meets on a monthly basis. And as we get new results, we share them with the group and we discuss the implications of that. And it also gives a chance that should there need to be tweaks made to the experimental method, we can do that in real time as well. Great. Um, I don't have any more questions at the moment, but um, if anyone does think of any, um, we will come back to Adrian at the end uh, to ask him questions. So thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. Um, I'll now hand over to Dave for his presentation. Thank you, Natalie. Right. Good morning, everyone. My name is... Oh. Dave Kay, I'm a plant pathologist with RSK DAS um, in horticulture, and I'm here to talk with you today about the um, site hygiene and its role in managing tomato brown rigus fruit virus. Now, um, Adrian's covered a lot of the topics um, that I'd originally planned to cover, which is great, so there'll be some element of overlap, but I have modified this slightly to incorporate a bit more as well. So, um, the topics that I'm going to be discussing today, I'm currently undertaking, as Nat said at the start, a hygiene study um, for the HDB. And this is looking at a review of the measures implemented by protected edible and mushroom growers, why these measures are used, and then um, what gaps and obstacles prevent the implementation of best practice. So I'll be including some information on that. And then I'll also be discussing um, tomato brown rigus fruit virus and the grower case studies I undertook last year. Um, and the report for that um, project is available on the um, HB website if, if you want further information than I'll be giving today. So a good place to start is to ask what is site hygiene and biosecurity? And um, this will be very uh, com uh, common sense to a lot of people, you'll know, you'll know what it is, but it can be broadly defined as the foundation of effective pest and disease management. You could probably include a fruit quality in there However, for the purposes of today, it'll be focusing on pest and disease management. And hygiene can be split into three sections, really. Pest and disease avoidance. You know, it's always better to avoid if you can. Pest and disease management, um, dealing with outbreaks it, it, should they occur. And then end of season cleanup and disinfection. And a lot of protected growers, uh, protected edible growers, are very fortunate in a way that you have the opportunity to almost reset your sites to clean up and disinfection. Um, it, it's a big task, but sometimes you will be able to eradicate um, certain pests and diseases, um, allowing you to restart fresh next year. 
this isn't always possible. Um, on the right hand side here, you've got an image of um, lettuce, um, which is suffering from fusarium wilt. This is up in the, in the site um, in Lancashire, I believe, where a new race of fusarium, race four, came through a few years ago. Um, unfortunately, it overcomes the resistance in commercial varieties and is present in the soil. So personal disease avoidance is no longer a, a possibility for these growers and they are having to deal with pest and disease management um, because end of season cleanup and disinfection isn't, isn't really possible because once it's in the soil, it's very, well, it's pretty much impossible to get rid of. You can sterilize using steam, for example, but you, you won't get it all um, and it will come back. So unfortunately, these growers are waiting for um, resistance to be bred into commercial varieties and they are changing how they're managing their crops as a consequence. So looking at uh, site hygiene, it can be, um, and maybe the critical hygiene and biosecurity risk periods, <clears throat> it can be split over, over the lifetime of the crop into five sections really, um, from the seed right through to crop turnaround, um, cleanup and site disinfection. So uh, seed has to be source clean, and as Adrian's mentioned, it, it's a real issue for some of the viruses which, which are seed borne. And so we have um, measures in place in order to ensure that seed is, is clean and free of disease. And this often, I think this came out as a result of Clavi Baptist. So we have schemes like the GSPP certification, which um, ensures that seed, seed is clean, but you should always request um, certification that your seed is free of, of, of disease if, if you're going to use it. And seed producers go to, to great lengths in order to grow clean seed and also to treat seed. Um, to ensure it's free of infection. The next risk period is propagators. Now propagators um, have some of the biggest risk of, of any um, anyone really and they have some of the tightest and most stringent hygiene protocols. In fact I think we could learn a lot from propagators. Um, obviously if they have pest and disease outbreaks there they run the risk of spreading it to other sites which can have a, a profound effect to, to the industry especially with something like to Marcy Brandrigger's fruit virus, um, or, or something like a Phytophthora infestans outbreak, which occurred a few years ago, which may or may not have, have come from propagation. The next risk period is transport. Now, this is only a very short risk period, but actually is high risk. If your propagator is clean and you've got clean plants and you've got a clean um, site that those plants are going to, transport can be actually quite a considerable risk. Um, plants have to be moved on trolleys, on um, by staff into um, lorries or, or freight or however it's being transported and everything there needs to be clean, disinfected because if you get an infection or, or a pest gets in there it can spread to your beautifully clean site. So it's really important that transport is um, managed well uh, and, and for hygiene measures are very strict. Moving on to the next risk period is going to be planting, cropping. This is the main life stage of the crop from when it's, it's planted out to when it's removed. And for many growers, um, it's, it's nearly impossible to uh, um, avoid all pest and disease outbreaks. Um, even if you start clean, um, as you should aim to do, pests and diseases will come in, maybe introduced via staff, visitors, equipment contractors. Maybe they'll blow in from the outside. Maybe they'll fly in from the outside. So um, this is where monitoring and, um, and good um, management is, is critical to, um, if you're not going to be able to avoid pest and disease outbreaks, at least you can delay pest and disease outbreaks, which will make the next risk period, cleanup and site disinfection, much easier. Now, many um, growers have very short crop turnarounds. And so this actually makes it harder for you to eradicate pests and diseases in that short period. Um, it's a real challenge and if you're unsuccessful you risk carryover and Adrian's already mentioned several diseases such as tomato brown rugus fruit virus, papino mosaic virus if you've still got debris which is infected left on your site, um, fusarium race 4 and lettuce which I mentioned and also um, cucumber green mottle mosaic virus as well. So it can be a real problem. So you need to use the right products at the right rates um, in the right way, such as foaming, like Huasan that Adrian mentioned, in order to ensure that you, you can eradicate or at least come as near to as possible. 
So what influences site hygiene? So as part of the um, work that I'm doing on hygiene for the HDB, I've spoken to a lot of, of growers and so have my team, and it's, it's not one size fits all, there's huge variation, um, and that's to be expected. Um, oh, you know, you can have an overarching um, an approach to site hygiene, but you, you can't be too generic. You have to focus on, on certain issues and, and, the, and the factors um, which are relevant to that. So I've made a list of the, the major ones here, but there's several others. So crop type is clearly going to influence your, your um, hygiene measures. If you grow something like tomato, you might be growing for the whole season, whereas cucumber, you might have two or three repeat crops, um, which will influence how you manage things. And mushroom is going to be very different to uh, micro herbs. Um, so it's all going to be a different approach dependent upon your crop. And variety as well. Um, resistance is key for things like disease management. Um, intermediate or high resistance can really help how you approach your hygiene and, and the severity of the measures you have to take. Um, tomato mosaic and tobacco mosaic weren't too much of a concern for tomato growers um, in the recent past. However, with the um, introduction of tomato brown rugo's fruit virus, <coughs> sorry, another tobacco virus, this has actually turned the industry on its head and hygiene measures have, have um, become much more strict. So resistant varieties are a key component in how you might <coughs> manage hygiene. I've already mentioned a bit about cultivation method, organic soil, organic or in the soil, looking back at those um, pictures of the lettuce fusarium, very difficult, a lot more um, things to consider when trying to um, maintain excellent hygiene in the soil compared with, with substrates for NFT or other growing methods. And site will influence hygiene. I've been to some you know, they're almost like cathedrals, these cavernous, huge glass houses with positive internal pressure, fantastic airflow, um, and the challenges that um, face those growers were very different to the challenges which face the much smaller growers, which might have um, old glass, sh shallower roofs, poor airflow, more difficulties maintaining humidity control. But it's also important to remember that many sites have old and new glass. So when um, when looking at hygiene um, and developing hygiene protocols, you can't just do, as I said, an overarching approach. You have to consider um, your different sections, your pack houses, your different glass houses, in order to um, to manage it all effectively. Time of year, oh sorry, experience. Um, you can't underestimate grower intu intuition and pest and disease history. Um, people who have worked in the crops for many years will just um, know um, and be able to recognize key things which, which um, they need to manage. And you can always learn and put your learnings into your, into your next year's protocols so that you're always improving your, your processes. Uh, time of year, at the start of the year, you want to start clean um, and end clean if you can. However, at the end of the growing season, off, often the case, you're waiting for the last few cucumbers to just finish ripening or the last few trusses. You may have turned down the heating um, and this can actually lead to a bit of an increase in disease or pests or maybe not pests at that point with the heating but um, by, if you take your foot off the pedal you can actually increase your issues however at the end of the season if you know you know you're going to be cleaning down in a few weeks it's often the case that people do that and that's more of an economical decision and in most cases it, it probably isn't an issue uh, looking at your staff um, I'll be talking about a site in a minute which had pretty much brand new staff as a consequence of being a new build and experience and training um, of staff and knowing what they should be looking out for. You, they just don't pick that up on day one. So staff training um, is, is critical and will influence your hygiene if they understand the measures that they're being asked to follow. Um, do they recognize what seems off? Often um, that's quite difficult until you've done a whole season. Business revenue, um, smaller, maybe um, older businesses, which aren't, aren't some of these giant structures we see, don't have the investment that other places do. There's an image on, on, the, image, on the slide here of a hygiene lock. These are a good um, practical reminder, as well as a good, um, you know, a good tool to help maintain hygiene, but not something that's practical for all growers to be able to afford. 
Similarly, um, with tomato brown rigorous fruit virus, some of the growers have got these low pressure steam sterilization units to, to make sure um, trays, return trays are, are clean. However, that's not always um, economically viable for smaller growers. But then maybe those larger growers with multiple glass houses on site might have bigger risk um, in relation to smaller growers with just one site. And finally, uh, the last point I want to raise is emerging pest and disease threats. We've had um, tomato brown rigorous fruit virus and TOMMV just raised by Adrian there. Um, and, you know, if you develop a hygiene protocol, you can't just, you know, it's never finished and you run the risk. Um, you always have to keep on updating it as you learn more things. And um, it should be an ongoing process which should be reviewed constantly throughout the year, not just at the end. So moving on to um, look at tomato brown rugos fruit virus and the case studies from last year. So these were three case studies I undertook to look at um, points of entry of the virus, to improve crop management and to improve strategies for eradicating the virus and preventing future outbreaks from occurring. As I've mentioned earlier, these are available on the AHDB website. Um, and this was three of the six, information from three of the six um, outbreaks that had occurred in the UK at the time. And because I don't have time to discuss it all today, I've actually condensed it into a table. Um, so there were three sites. Site one was in 2019, and that was the first site that had the outbreak. And that was detected by the grower there because the statutory surveillance program wasn't up and running. However, um, they, did, they took a really positive approach to it. They had already sought information, as had much of the industry because of the concern over the virus, and um, spread was controlled. They had more than one site, uh, one glass house on their site, but they managed to keep the virus in that one glass house. Um, they detected it early, very early in fact. There was no um, removal of, there was no deleafing and there was no harvest. So they were able to keep the inoculum level down and they chose to get rid of it early and they eradicated it from their site. Now, when I say eradicated here, um, that means that there were 12 months after the crop was removed and replanted where there was no positive test for tomato brown rugus root virus. The other two sites, which I'll move on to in just now, they, they are under eradication because there haven't been those 12 months of negative tests yet because we haven't had 12 months since, um, since their outbreaks. So site two um, and three were from this year, from last year now, sorry. And these were detected by the statutory surveillance program, which has been fantastically useful. Um, Spread, I put NA for spread controlled. There weren't other glass houses on the site, so we don't know whether they would have been prevented from spreading locally, but they didn't spread to any of the other glass house production sites nearby. Um, they were both detected in crop, unlike site one, which was detected very early on. These were detected um, a bit later on after several months of cropping. And as I've mentioned, they were under eradication. Um, what I will say, for site three, um, S, um, PHSI statutory surveillance detected it early. However, they had no symptoms for quite some time, which implies that um, by maintaining high plant health, you can keep the virus um, asymptomatic in those plants. Obviously, more research needs to go into this, but that's um, something to note of interest. And it wasn't until there was a severe irrigation stress to those plants that it was almost like a switch, is, a switch had been turned on and they it went to um, very severe symptoms. In fact, symptoms um, on this image here um, across 100% of plants. So try and keep plants um, unstressed. So it's important to look at what went wrong. And um, basically outbreaks occurred at all three production sites. However, hygiene and biosecurity, which means hygiene and biosecurity procedures were not sufficient to prevent infections occurring. Um, to give you a little bit more information about these sites, site one was that early outbreak and there was little information available and they were unlucky, um, but we've progressed so far since then. Site two, this site wasn't actually completely finished, but the overall structure was, however, there was still work to be done inside which meant their security, uh, biosecurity and hygiene was reduced. They had contractors workers in, and that's where they believe they may have had that infection come in. 
And then finally, site three. This isn't actually a, a commercial tomato grower. They grow tomato, but they're, they're, they grow other things um, predominantly. And as a very small 1.2 hectare glass house, they did have lower hygiene and biosecurity standards, which have since been increased. But the real question is, where did the virus come from? Um, did it come from propagation? This is a possibility for site one where it was detected early. However, other plants for other glass houses on site also came from the same propagator and they didn't show symptoms. Um, so that may not be the case. Did it carry over from previous seasons? That's possible from the previous season. So that is possible. Um, if the plants in the same glass house were infected at the end of 2018 but didn't show symptoms, um, and then there was inoculum which survived the cleaning process to the next season, it could have infected the plants the next year, or was it introduced by staff and visitors? Um, we don't know. Similarly, at site two, we can be confident it didn't come from the previous season because there wasn't one, but um, we don't know where it came from definitively, but that we are suspicious it came, or the growers are suspicious it came from the contractors um, who were on site. And then finally at site three, because it, there was asymptomatic infection for so long, um, it could have potentially come from the propagator but not shown, um, or it was introduced from the previous season or, or staff and visitors. But at this stage, we, we can't tell where the infection has come from on those sites. And that's actually a critical um, piece of information to know um, in order to help us control this disease. So we focused briefly on what went wrong, but let's just look at what went right. Um, in all cases, the virus was identified by staff and all PHSI surveillance, which is fantastic. We could test for it and confirm its presence. And guidance was sought and management actions were taken immediately. No one sat on their laurels. Everyone was proactive in their approach and the industry was already proactive in trying to learn information about this before um, these outbreaks. Um, good biosecurity, I mentioned site one didn't see it spread to other glass houses on site. So biosecurity was good enough, it just wasn't, um, it wasn't good enough to prevent that infection. And sites two and three didn't see spread locally or to other glass houses. And all sites had a thorough and comprehensive cleanup process. And site one, as I said, eradicated following those 12 months of negative tests. But we're just waiting on that information for sites two and three when that time period's up. But one thing I would say that went really right is the industry-wide um, action and communication. And that was fantastic because that hasn't happened everywhere in the world. And by sharing and talking with each other um, and, and things like the Tomato Brown Rugus Fruit Virus Steering Group, it's really enabled us, I think, to um, learn an awful lot very quickly and get that information out there. So it's important to continue that. So in conclusion, um, disease avoidance is always critical for whatever hygiene or, or even pest avoidance is critical as well for whatever disease or pest. Um, and you should update your hygiene and biosecurity pro protocols regularly. And for tomato brown rugus fruit virus, you should develop site specific action plans if you haven't already. Don't wait for an outbreak, be proactive. As Adrian said, it's, it's good to know that things are clean going through. So ensure that seed is confirmed clean or free of tomato brown rugus fruit virus and request that young plants be tested at propagators for peace of mind. But you can also test plants on arrival and continue to routinely test plants. Don't rely just on statutory surveillance program, don't wait for that. And if something seems a bit off afterwards, um, just, you know, it won't hurt to send it in and get it checked. It's better to be informed than to not know. Continue to monitor your crops frequently, train your staff, restrict staff movement and visitors. Can you do the work yourself? If you can, do so. And provide PPE gloves, laundered gloves, foot dips, wheel dips, but you know, these will be effective against many diseases. As Adrian said, there's concern over foot dips with tomato brown rugus fruit virus, but it's still good advice. And then when you do remove crops, do it carefully and clean down with products which you know are to be effective against um, tomato brown rugus fruit virus. And you can see the information that Adrian shared with PE033 um, earlier on. And I think that's it. So just don't take your foot off the pedal and just um, always keep going with, with hygiene and biosecurity and keep on updating. And finally, just to thank the HDB Horticulture for funding the work.
as well as the steering group, um, which I'm also a part of, which is a fantastic um, group of people in order to, to help the industry and learn as much as possible, and also the growers who contributed to, to my work. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, so, from discussions with different businesses on hygiene measures, um, were there any recurring themes that growers identified as obstacles to improving or investing in better biosecurity? Um, time, money and space have been raised as concerns, um, but obviously money is going to be an issue for investment. Um, information and also, um, you know, you want to know something works, which is why some of the things like um, when we can show practically through our experimental work as researchers that gives um, growers that peace of mind that you know they're not taking such a big risk um, in choosing to invest and implement something. Thank you, Dave. Um, do you want to just stop sharing your screen just because we can see your desktop oh, at the moment? <laughs> and apologies for my phone going off just then. <clears throat> Um, so another question, can you tell how um, infection sometimes comes into glass houses based on a pattern of an outbreak? Sorry, no, you froze then, could you repeat the question? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, can you tell how an infection came into a glass house, I guess for contact transmissible viruses such as tomato brown or ghost fruit virus? based on a pattern of the outbreak within the crop? That, I think, and Adrian might be able to, to uh, give more information at the end, but um, that's quite a difficult one because um, sometimes they're, they're so transmissible that you've, you've transmitted it to every plant before you're having symptoms. Um, in one of those case studies, we saw symptoms appear at the warmer end of the glasshouse first and then progress to the cooler. But that isn't to say that the infection occurred first at the warmer side, it might just be the heat led to, to a greater degree of um, expression of symptoms. So for um, obviously, if you have a, a very high viral load, you might, and it, it's very sudden, um, you might be able to see where it starts, but often it's confounded by the conditions and the fact it spread so quickly, or tomato brown rigus root virus. Yeah, so I suppose you can you can potentially have an idea, but it's very, very difficult to confirm, isn't it? So, And that's um, why um, disease avoidance is so critical for any pest or disease and why, um, you know, testing it, testing is very useful and having people know what to look, look out for, because sometimes you can be asymptomatic for a while or sometimes symptoms can be very subtle or confused with other things. Yeah. OK, thank you, Dave. Um, I think we'll move on for now. But again, if anyone has further questions, we'll uh, bring you back in at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Um, we'll now move on to Dave Chandler to um, talk about uh, pollination performance of our native bumblebee. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Natalie. Can you see the screen OK? Yeah, yeah Brilliant. perfect. Okay. Yeah, and, and apologies. Um, I've got no webcam. I'm officially deemed too ugly to be shown on screen. No, it's, it's not that I've um, I have a Mac um, and it's not compatible with the, the webinar thing. So um, it's audio only from me. Um, I'm going to talk about our research looking at uh, the performance of the native bumblebee, Bombus trestris audax on tomato and this is work led by Rob Jacobson and it involves me, uh, Ken Cockshaw as a tomato physiologist and, and Jill Prince who, who does the majority of the work um, on the project. So in 2015, Natural England required growers to switch to the British bumblebee subspecies, Bombus trestris or dax and um, also, almost immediately when that occurred, there were problems reported with, with tomato fruit set. Prior to that, for, for nearly 30 years, uh, pollination had been done by a non-native subspecies called Bombus trestris terrestris or Bombus trestris dalmatinus. Um, in, in fact, in reality, these two subspecies are effectively one um, breeding population. But as I said, um, 
the pollination had been very, very effective um, with those and, and no problems really at all. A huge success story for, for the industry. And um, within two years of the ban being brought in effectively, growers were reporting that the native subspecies that they were using was less vigorous um than the non-native species subspecies that have been used to and rob did a very extensive survey in the tomato industry and the, the results are very conclusive of that so nearly half of the growers surveyed thought that the bta that's the uh, native bees the colony life was shorter than the non-natives and um usually at least 20 percent more hives were being required to actually provide pollination of the crop again compared to the non-natives and and this is this is really pertinent a common question uh, reported by nursery staff is where are the bees because they just weren't seeing the flight traffic of the bees that they were used to in, in the nursery um so what were the problems with fruit set well the the main observation is that the small fruiting types were uh, most commonly affected um, by poor fruit set and, and this was occurring despite the use of more hives in the nurseries and, and secondly these problems were associated with periods of hot weather or the very high sunshine hours and I'll come back to the kind of the temperature things later on in the talk. Um, critically Natural England have claimed that there's not a problem with the uh, native bees and that's why the effective ban has been kept in place except under exceptional circumstances and the reasons for the problems of fruit set are complex and that's what this project is about to try and understand the reasons and um, part of the reason it's difficult is because of just a lack of basic data on the biology of the native bumblebee because um, it hasn't been used before for, for pollination and also there's a lack of basic agronomic data on modern UK tomato varieties with things like um, their response to temperature and then there's also the fact that we're not talking about um, kind of a single issue occurring but there's kind of interactions obvious interactions between um, the the plant and the bee itself which have kind of non-linear dynamics to them so that makes it quite difficult and really what we're working towards is is the ability to do side by side comparisons of natives and non-native bees critically so that we can actually get the definitive data to go to natural england and say look this is a problem so this is a graph that, that Rob Jacobson often shows, and it's um, really a graph showing the change in the numbers of bumblebees that you would expect in a hive over time. And it's based on, it's a trend, and it's based on what occurs in the wild, but also the experience with non-natives. And, and you can see that the numbers start off small, and then they peak at about, 20 weeks and then they they go into a decline and so obviously we're talking about commercially reared bumblebees in which the commercial production starts off with um, the fertile queen laying eggs and then um, the queen and the eggs are in an artificial hive usually made of plastic and um, the, the colony is nurtured by the producer until it reaches a sufficient size when it's deemed big enough to go into the crop and that's normally about 12 weeks um, from onset and then after that you have a period of between six to eight weeks before the colony goes into decline and it goes into decline because when it reaches a peak it then starts to produce sexually fertile males and females and then that, that's part of the natural life cycle for, for bumblebees because remember the bumblebee colonies only last for a year in the wild anyway. So we have this period of between six and eight weeks when numbers are increasing and that's when you should be getting uh, a productive beehive with sufficient bees for pollination. But when we observe what's happening with the uh, native bees in tomato crops, we don't see that at all. Um, this is data that Rob generated. It's counts of adult bees uh, from 40 colonies 
of uh, Bombus Tresis Aldax at one site in 2018. And the counts were done using an activity index in which the, the uh, lid was taken off the hive, the top of the hive to observe the inside of the hive, the top of the hive is, is tapped a few times and then the bees come to the top. And from that, you can kind of get an estimate of the number of adults um, inside the, the hive. So it's not an absolute count and I'll come on to absolute count data in a minute but um, it's, it's a relative count. The, the key thing is that you can actually see from this graph then rather than increasing for six to eight weeks after placement, the numbers, relative numbers actually go down and they start to go down from the very beginning. So we have a steady decline from the time of placement of the hive in the crops. And if things were okay, we should actually expect an increase. Um, this is the data from um, detailed studies we've done of BTA hives at three different nurseries where we've done things like actually dissect the, the, the hives and counted the exact numbers of bees inside them. And we've also measured the flight traffic of those bees as well by counting the number of bees that go in and out over a set period. And basically, those experiments show that we are they're confirming what the, the you know growers have suspected and told us and from Rob's preliminary data as well that we're getting low numbers of bees. There's no effective increase in the number of bees over time, and we're getting low flight traffic. So this was done on uh, two cherries, one baby plum, and with two different bee suppliers. So the, the thing I need to emphasize that it's this isn't a supplier issue, it's actually an issue to do with the subspecies of bee itself. So the first thing we do from our kind of hive dissections where we're taking hives at, at set periods and then freezing them and then counting the number of adult bees and pupae and larvae that we get variation in a number of bees per hive but but overall numbers are generally very low and um, far lower than we would expect but you do get this odd hive which has high uh, high numbers and that, that actually confounds some of the types of experimental work we can do in the crop um, but worryingly about 40 percent of the hives um, in, in this study that we looked at on tomato crops had less than 10 larvae or pupae at about three to five weeks. And we would normally expect uh, the colony to be increasing by then and we'd have much higher numbers of larvae and who, uh, pupae. No pattern of increase with age, as I said, we'd, we'd normally expect the numbers to go up, but we get no pattern. They, they seem to be static or, or decline in age. And, and as a result of that, the flight activity, that, that's, that's a traffic, the number of bees going in and out of the hive um, of BTA and greenhouses is very low, except for these odd hives where we, for some reason that we don't understand, we actually get higher numbers of bees. Um, this table which I've just uh, pinged up, this um, is counts we've done for uh, bees in hives and the, the top line um, is for two hives so it's a very very small sample but we took two hives and we put them outside in our apple orchard we have at Wellsbourne and we uh, counted the numbers of bees in the hives at kind of three to five weeks and then the, the bottom one is for 46 hives um, which were sampled and dissected at three to five weeks. And that again, that's the number of bees. And um, you can see a, a really significant difference, a big difference. And I, I do believe that the two hives and the outdoor environment are representative. And you can see it's really big difference. So in the outdoor, which is a natural environment for BTA, we're getting an average 240 adult bees at three to five weeks. Whereas in the glass house, we're just getting 55. So, so a big difference. Um, this this graph on the left, this is uh, data for bee traffic. That's a number of bees coming in and out of a hive over the course of an hour. And it's for 10 different hives on the, the same nursery on the same crop in 2019. And the traffic is, is generally low. But can you see on, on the left, there's that one hive which has a much higher uh, traffic rate than, than others. So there's kind of inconsistency in the number of bees and, and the flight traffic. <clears throat> 
um, and this is data that, that Rob generated. We have generated quite a lot of data looking at the, the pattern of how uh, bees fly. Um, we've compared how bees fly when the hives are kept outdoors in a natural situation and compared it to um, the pattern of flight over a day when they're indoors. And this is a kind of a typical indoor pattern. Um, and this is for two hives um, side by side on a nursery which had much higher numbers of bees compared to the average number of bees um, in the hives in that particular crop. And you can see uh, the line, I think it's blue, I'm profoundly colorblind, so I have trouble with this, but uh, I think it's the, the top line is the number of bees going out. And then we have number of bees going in, the red line that's in carrying pollen. And then the bottom line is the number of bees going into the hive without pollen. And, and so the basic pattern is that the bees start to fly after sunrise, they kind of peak at about lunchtime, there's a bit of a dip, and then they do an afternoon forage and then it declines in the evening. And, and we actually see this pattern outdoors. So the, the overall pattern of flight activity is the same indoors and outdoors. It's just that the numbers um, in most hives is much, much lower. We've also looked at um, flower development and um, we wanted to see whether um, the pattern of flower development and also the pattern of pollen flow um, on the flowers on the small fruiting varieties um, were in synchrony with when the bees were flying because that was one hypothesis is that maybe uh, the, the pollen flow was occurring during times of the day or even at night when, when the bees aren't flying. But um, the upshot of that is that we do get pollen flow, which is in synchrony when the bees are flying. Um, so we kind of categorize six different stages of flower development from kind of uh, the, the buds first opening to the flower opening. And then stage four is when the flowers are fully reflexed. And that's when you tend to get pollen flow, and then you get pollination, senescence of the flower, and then stage six is where you get first fruit development. Um, this graph is kind of a typical pattern of flower development. It's, so it's development over a single flower on a truss um, over time, but as I said, it's typical for, for piccolo. And a uh, key point here is that um, you get reflex, fully reflex flowers occurring over uh, two successive days. Obviously, the flowers close at night, but that's when you get pollen flow when they're reflexed, and the majority of the pollen is flowing during the first day. Um, this little table here is for uh, pollen counts from piccolo, baby plum, and a classic round. We just wanted to ensure that the flowers were actually producing sufficient pollen to actually pollinate the, the plant and actually get fruit production. And we can confirm that is the case, although with piccolo and baby plum, you get much lower uh, pollen produced than you would with a classic round, which you would expect because uh, um, the, the flower is a lot smaller. So we know we're getting poor pollination by BTA. What's happening? Well, we know now that we, we've confirmed grow observation. That's really important because we can go to Natural England with the data. So we've got low bee numbers in the uh, native bee hives. And, and that's because the bee numbers don't increase when the hives are placed in the crop. Although there are some exceptions, we don't know why there are exceptions and we don't yet know why the bee numbers aren't increasing uh, when they're placed in a tomato crop. But because bee numbers are low in a hive, the bee, the bee flight traffic is, is low. So we're not getting many bees coming in and out to pollinate the crop. And um, the problems from grower observations are um, more uh, challenging and more severe when we have very hot conditions. And I'll come on to this in, in a second. We know that the flowers produce enough pollen, but we don't yet know if that pollen is fireball. And that's particularly important when it comes to high temperatures, because the literature says that high temperatures can severely reduce pollen viability. So what could be happening with the situation? So obviously we have an interaction, two-way interaction occurring between the bee and the flower itself. So the bee is getting pollen for nutrition from the flower and the flower is getting pollinated. But we also have this environmental component 
and be particularly concerned with the effects of high temperature, both on the, the crop itself and on the bee. So with the native bees, we know that the numbers don't increase when they're placed in the crop. We know that there's variability in the colony size as received by the grower in the greenhouse. And um, studies done in Canada with bombus, um, a different species of bombus, but still a bombus used for pollination of tomato, shows that in unscreened glass houses on tomato, uh, the bumblebees preferentially leave and they prefer to uh, forage on plants outside the greenhouse. So there's something about tomato that they, they don't like given a choice. And there's also been some research published in the literature shows that some tomato volatiles produced by flowers um, can have a small repellent effect. So that's something we need to think about as well. Um, and another question that we need to address is whether hot conditions actually inhibit the activity of the native bees. Because uh, when you get temperatures above about 30 degrees, um, the bees stop flying and they stay within the hive and they fan, they fan their wings to actually cool the brood um, because they don't want the, the larvae and the eggs and the pupae to get, to get too hot, otherwise uh, their development will stop. And so one obvious hypothesis is that maybe the British bees, which come from uh, evolved in northern temperate uh, regions, are adapted to colder temperatures than the non-native bees, which come from southern Europe and then which uh, may well be more tolerant of higher temperatures. On the, the, the left hand side, we've got issues about the, the crop itself. So we know that varieties uh, like piccolo produce enough pollen for full development. But a question which is still open is whether uh, hot conditions inhibit pollen production and viability. And that's really important as we move forward into the kind of era of global, global climate heating. The literature says that you know, conditions of heat stress do significantly, significantly reduce pollen production and germination, and there are varietal differences. And also lower conditions of heat stress, for example, uh, 28 by the day and 22 at night can also reduce uh, fruit set depending on variety, but we don't have the data for the UK varieties yet. So in summary, we know we've got low B numbers, we know we've got poor pollination, and we know that the situation is made worse during conditions of stress. Um, we have this whole issue about the ban by Natural England, which was done on the basis of risk because Natural England was concerned that non-native bee subspecies used for pollination could escape from the greenhouse and they could hybridise with wild uh, Bombus terrestris aldax and cause some kind of genetic pollution, if you like. We actually reviewed the literature, so there's a paper there. On, on the right hand side, um, it's a really comprehensive paper which we reviewed the entirety of the literature about the biology of Bombus terrestris and, um, and its kind of risk of um, gene introgression. And we found that there's actually no strong evidence that kind of hybridization has occurred between non-natives and natives in the UK. And, and in fact, there is evidence that the non-native subspecies Bombus terrestris terrestris does naturally cross from um, to England, from mainland Europe. Um, they've been seen flying across the channel and there is genetic evidence that there is natural hybridization anyway. There's another bee species called Bombus hypnorum, which is native to France. And about 10 years ago, that naturally crossed from the channel and into England, uh, probably as a result of, of climate change, and that's naturally colonised um, the UK from, from France and is moving north. So we know that there's this natural period of genetic mixing. What we're doing in a, in a project is developing a genetic test to be able to uh, readily differentiate the, the different subspecies, because I think it's been really important as a, as a kind of a tool to look at um, genetic risks in the future and to go to Natural England and actually challenge them. I think we need to do about um, the decisions made about um, um, use of natives, non-natives. I think when it when it comes to use of non-natives and natives, the ideal situation in terms of um, zero risk would be to use um, native bees, but we need to be able to get them working 
properly and so that's what we're addressing in the next stage of the project so we're doing experiments to determine whether uh, the native species of bee are more susceptible to high temperatures than non-natives we're it's very very tricky to do this it's really challenging but we're developing an experimental method to detect that at the moment um the, the plan is to actually record hive lifespan and activity through the season so we can actually do side-by-side -side comparisons of natives and non-natives in, in the same commercial crop and get this definitive data about uh, numbers of bees and um, lifespan of, of, of the hive. We're um, just starting in the next couple of weeks experiments at Wellsbourne and the effect of temperature on pollen production and viability. So Jill has developed a method to actually measure pollen germination and pollen viability so we can have uh, different varieties um, under controlled temperature conditions and then determine the effect of, of higher temperatures on pollen viability. So remember it's this interaction between the effect of temperature on the crop on one hand and effect of temperature on the bee and the interaction between the two that's, that's critical and uh, we're developing this genetic test as i say so we'll be able to differentiate between the different subspecies of bee which i think is really important uh, for risk assessment um going ahead in in the future and and that's it that's all that's all i wanted to, to say thank you to everyone who's involved um in the project and very happy to to take questions now. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think we're actually going to, I'll move on to John quickly. Okay, just cause yeah, because I'm over one. Yeah, yeah. Over. yeah no and then, problem. Um, hopefully we can come back for questions at the end um, if people want to stay on <laughs> during the break. Um, so John, over to you, a bit of a change of uh, subject onto net zero. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being present and uh, taking time to out of your busy days to hear what we've got to say. Um, hopefully my screen is sharing, hopefully we are in slideshow mode. I know it's a little bit slow occasionally, a little bit laggy. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, sort of net zero energy strategy, sort of building on the, uh, the sort of dedicated webinar that we had um, a month or so ago. On, uh, on carbon footprinting and net zero and what that means for protected horticulture and sort of building some of those pieces around it and hopefully trying to stimulate some uh, thought and some interest in what we're actually going to do about our carbon footprinting in energy terms. Um, so just uh, clearly we've been dealing with the Grosso project um, for a good number of years and this work is sort of funded as part of that, uh, that programme and uh, we continue to do that and uh, it goes down well with, with growers and, uh, and, uh, and industry as the like. But uh, Grosso pages on AHDB website um, will take you to further information or come and talk to any, any of us at NFU Energy. A bit of plug for Grosso. Right, into net zero. So what is net zero? It's important, I think, just to re review this um, and continually to remind ourselves what actually net zero means, because it's become too much of this buzzword that everyone is quite happy to trot out and say, oh, yes, we're going for net zero, aren't we? But quite often people aren't clear what that truly means. Net zero is making sure that the carbon emissions that we are putting out are somehow balanced by actions to take to remove that carbon emissions somewhere else or in some other way. Um, and so ultimately we can say we don't have any carbon emissions because we've taken enough action to mitigate the carbon emissions that we have, uh, uh, have produced. And that's what people truly mean when they say net zero. Ideally, in, in the world, if we're going to arrest the, uh, the temperature changes that we've got and reduce carbon um, concentrations in the atmosphere, we all want to be getting to growth zero and not adding any more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere at all. However, that probably means no activity at all either, and that's not going to be a palatable situation, um, not least because we won't be producing any food if we do that. Um, so net zero is when um, our carbon emissions are balanced by our actions to reduce those carbon emissions or to offset those carbon emissions. Um, clearly, the offsetting actions that we take are best done when we've reduced the emissions that we're having in the first place. So any efficiencies that we can undertake, any ways that we can do the same thing with less CO2 means that any offtake, any um, offsets that we've got to do are significantly less. So the first important part is to reduce our emissions in the first place and then to take action to, to balance the emissions that we have 
um, unavoidably uh, created. Clearly, there's everyone's piling into net zero commitments, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but your goal could be 2030, 2040, 2050, or anywhere in between um, to tackle the carbon emissions in your business. Um, and if we think about that conceptually, 2030 is eight years, nine months away. Um, so getting very close. And if you have a target by the person that you're selling your produce to, to, to hit net zero in energy terms, or even as a business as a whole, um, by 2030, that's quite some ta task, quite some challenge to, to achieve. Um, if we think what we've done in the last eight years, nine months, and the kind of change that we might have to undertake in the forthcoming eight years, nine months, I think the, the, the challenge becomes obvious. The problem is our emission sources, um, and this is of agriculture as a whole. Um, the red bar on the left hand side is how our emissions are sort of at 2017 and probably very close to how they are currently. Um, and the green bar on the right hand side is sort of the proposed action that agriculture will take as a whole. Now, as growers, as protected horticulture, then most of our emissions will probably sit in this uh, very red bar at the top here which is a significantly smaller proportion of methane emissions from livestock and nitrous oxide emissions from the land. Um, so that's our challenge. And um, I'm not saying all of that is for protected horticulture, but that's where our challenge lies in that, in that section there. Um, and the good thing about that is actually we can start to create actions to, to mitigate those emissions. And they're easily um, achievable in comparison to some of the other less um, developed science in, uh, in land emissions and in methane emissions from livestock. As we say, our, our first step is to reduce emissions. I think that's um, quite clear to me. And as an energy efficiency died in the wool um, consultant, um, I always think that we should be doing more with less, or, or at least as the same with less. Um, so efficiency is a key part of what, we, what we, our strategy should be. Um, and it's yeah, one of our tackles is energy here. What I've, I'm concerned about really is that we have this sort of pathway to net zero, um, and yeah, it, it involves all of these sort of six things. Um, but we're getting really hung up at the moment on this understanding our emissions and measuring our emissions. And the problem is with that is it kind of takes away from the challenge of the next steps, which are actually doing something about them. And I suppose what I'd like to say is that action is needed and action is needed now. And some of these things don't necessarily need us to understand the, the true, accurate, 100% completed numbers to know that we can actually reduce and do something about our emissions going forward. So a big part of strategy needs to be action rather than just understanding and, and, and measurement. Once we've got those down, then I think we can talk about and think about sequestering emissions or, um, or doing something else. Just sort of finally, as a, as a bit of a conceptual end, um, what do those emissions look like? Well, let's try to visualise what a tonne of carbon looks like. Um, clearly not a great, great big um, pyramidal block on the, like on the left hand side. Um, however, what causes a tonne of carbon dioxide emissions? So from the point of view of burning electricity from the grid, it's four megawatts of lighting for an hour. Um, it's uh, a gas boiler running for just under an hour. It's driving 700 miles in, in, in a lorry, et cetera, et cetera. And when we start to think about that, yes, a tonne of emissions doesn't actually um, seem uh, very difficult to get to. Um, we can get there very, very quickly with some of the actions that we take in protected horticulture. OK, so just sort of moving on, I, I, as part of this and part of the previous um, talk that I gave, I created a what I would call a model nursery, a five hectare glass house, both in a lit or an unlit state um, in terms of a, uh, um, maybe tomatoes or cucumbers or peppers or something like that. And these are the, the conceptual emissions that you would um, have in terms of tons of carbon dioxide for, for that glass house in, in terms of that, that five hectare area. And you can see clearly that a lit crop, unsurprisingly, has significantly more emissions than an unlit crop. Um, and you can see the difference between having efficient um, boiler equipment and inefficient boiler equipment in terms of their, the carbon emissions. And most of our emissions, mostly in the, in the unlit crop, are tied up in heating. 
um, and quite a significant proportion of our emissions, even in the lit crop, are, are tied up in heating. Although, of course, we're going to add in quite significant amounts of, uh, of electricity to keep those lights on. Of course, you know, when we're thinking about unlit crops, then the chances are we will have gas boilers and mains electricity. When we're thinking about lit crops, we're probably thinking about combined heat and power. And over the last sort of 10, 15 years or so, combined heat and power has become incredibly popular in uh, protective growing for good reason. Uh, and most of that reason is economic um, because of the difference in price between gas uh, and electricity. And of course, does it have an effect of carbon emissions too? So just adding that into our model then, yes, um, CHP does help. CHP does help in reducing our carbon emissions a little, probably not as much as we would like. And there's a couple of good sort of underlying reasons for that, um, and we'll come on to them in, in a minute. But conceptually, how does CHP help? Well, we are buying gas, we're producing electricity. Um, and as we're buying gas at so many grams per kilowatt hour of um, embodied emissions and offsetting good electricity at so many grams per kilowatt hour of uh, embodied emissions, then we can get a credit for that electricity. And so we can uh, start to reduce our carbon footprint um, uh, in terms of using CHP. But the effect isn't marked and it isn't marked at the moment um, compared to previous years because of the way that um, the grid has decarbonized. In a couple of slides time, I'll show you some graphs on how the mains electricity grid has, uh, has changed over the last um, good number of years. Just sort of adding another layer onto that then in terms of our strategies to reduce carbon emissions, clearly we're gonna to start to think about renewable energy. Um, and so I should put in some renewable energy into my model glass house and see how that reduces its carbon emissions. It has quite a marked effect. Um, we reduce our carbon emissions by over, uh, well, just about half um, in the uh, in the crop by going to a heat pump, and even even a bit more when you go to a biomass and buy mains electricity. And then the unlit crop, not so much to go at, but actually um, proportionally a bigger effect um, because we're dominating in heat terms in terms of our carbon emissions in the uh, in the unlit glass house. So renewable energy has an effect, and of course we all know that, we all understand that, that's why um, uh, governments have supported it over the, la the last few years, the last 10-15 years, in terms of feeding tariff and renewable heat incentive, and that's why a good number of people um, in the audience and no doubt uh, in, in the wider community have taken up renewable energy. Um, most people will be replacing like for like, and most people who have taken up um, renewable energy in horticulture have taken it up in that biomass space rather than in that heat pump space. Um, uh, but there are sort of uh, um, indications that that is, that, or the balance in that is changing and is likely to change significantly in the future. But yes, conceptually, moving to renewable energy has an effect on our carbon emissions. So whilst we're there and thinking about heat pumps um, and electricity and CHP and so on, it's useful to put in how the grid is being de decarbonized. And this I'm talking about the electricity grid, not the gas grid. Um, and here is a graph of our carbon emissions per or grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour um, of electricity uh, produced by the grid. And you can see the trend is quite marked um, and it sort of uh, had quite a marked change down to 97, fairly flat, flattened out, stayed pretty stable up to 2010, 2011. And then we've had quite some significant declines in the carbon emissions of electricity since then. Uh, today we're sitting around about 200 um, and back in 2010, 2011, we were, you know, it's 450, 500 type mark. Um, and yes, it's been uh, it's sort of halved over the last 10 years or so. Most of that's been coming from reducing in our coal power, coal fired power stations. And I think the news today, well, not you know, the news this week rather, was that uh, another coal fired power station has stopped um, operating. Uh, I think that one's in Nottinghamshire um, from memory. But yes, reducing our coal um, uh, power, power stations has had the biggest effect of that. And of course, the next biggest effect is because of the amount of renewable energy we've been piling into the grid. So uh, dominating or starting to be dominated by offshore wind 
and also large amounts of, uh, of solar PV, as well as moving um, Drax power station from coal to biomass. <coughs> That trend is going to set to continue and National Grid published these what they call future energy scenarios. How is that gas, uh, sorry, how is that electricity grid going to change? And this is where they think it might be in 2050. Uh, and the makeup of the grid is um, dominated, massively dominated by renewable um, electricity um, and sort of takes that trend on offshore wind to, to much greater um, uh, capacity. Yeah, and nearly um, two thirds the sorry, and nearly three times as much onshore wind as offshore wind, uh, offshore wind and onshore wind. If I get that right, um, and yeah, much larger than solar. Nuclear, of course, comes with zero carbon emissions associated sort of conceptually. So really, um, even if we consider our gas-fired um, power stations and our imported electricity from the continent as as having carbon associated with them in, in the same sort of level, we're actually going to end up with carbon emissions for our electricity around about 20 grams of CO2 instead of 200 today. So a tenth of what it is today over the next uh, 20 years or so. In heating fuels, and this I'm really thinking about uh, gas and oils that we're burning, there's less good news. Um, and that is because uh, predominantly, Greening the gas grid um, and greening oils is um, much more of a minority sport. Um, we're nowhere near as advanced in that, um, and we're going to carry on sort of being dominated by the burning of fossil based fuels, um, uh, which have carbon emissions associated with them, mostly around about the same sort of level for, for each fuel. There's going to be biomethane coming into that, possibly hydrogen in the future. And so we can conceptually see that the reductions in carbon emissions from the gas grid are going to be maybe 20% compared to you know, the 90% in the electricity grid. So we need to think about what our technological changes might be individually. And we talked about renewable energy earlier, how we're going to get to um, that for our individual um, consumptions and we're going to need to think about renewable energy and not rely on the gas grid to decarbonize to, to help us out in the same way that the electricity grid has helped us out in our electricity emissions. Heat pumps have been the cornerstone of the government's plan um, for a couple of years now in how to reduce the carbon emissions for heating in the country as a whole. Um, how does that work? Well, yes, you burn gas. Um, inefficiencies of gas boiler means that in heat terms, it might be somewhere between 211 and 238 grams of CO2 for that kilowatt hour of heat that you've delivered to your glass house. Con uh, conversely, if you deliver that heat by electricity means through a heat pump, then because its efficiency is uh, sort of about 500% or a COP of five, then one kilowatt hour of electricity with carbon emissions associated with it delivers you five kilowatt hours of heat, then the uh, carbon emissions per kilowatt hour of heat delivered is a fifth. So yeah, 40 grams to 67 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of that heat. And that's why people are getting really excited about the potential of heat pumps to reduce the, uh, the, the carbon emissions associated with heating in the UK. Clearly, if the grid electricity decarbonizes further, then that dwindles further still. Uh, and just to, to see that in action, um, this is what happens. Um, and uh, we'll talk about CHP in a second, but you can see that um, our renewables graph shows that um, we are getting significant carbon reductions by going to having the, uh, the grid changes applied to us, the main grid um, changes applied to us if we're going to use a heat pump and mains electricity. Um, and similar in both the lit crop and in the, the unlit crop. Interestingly, I think this is worthy of note that um, CHP gets worse. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're now no longer offsetting electricity onto the main electricity network at uh, 200 uh, grams of CO2. We're trying to offset electricity onto the electricity network at 20 grams of CO2 and 2050 emissions factors. And of course, we're producing it with significantly more carbon associated with it than that because we're burning gas uh, in CHP to get to that level. So we're actually making the, uh, the electricity grid less, um, less green. 
And so the sort of palatable answer on, on CHP is that really we can't rely on CHP to continue to provide decarbonisations. And at some point uh, there'll be a re realisation of this amongst government of that, I'm sure, and we'll start to see um, stricter measures about where CHP is relevant and why it's relevant. And therefore we need to think about how we move away from this type of heating system um, and into more renewable types of heating systems in order to keep our net zero emissions as low as they possibly can be. So grid decarbonisation has both help us uh, and massively hinder us, um, depending on the type of heating system makeup that you have. And therefore individual strategies need to, need to change and individual strategies need to be developed based around what you want and the technology that you are currently employing versus what you uh, potentially might employ in the future. So, so just leaving uh, you with some thoughts and final thoughts as we come towards the end. Um, decarbonising heat is the biggest part of our energy strategy in, in protected cropping and that shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. Uh, and we've got to think, start thinking laterally about where that's coming from. Um, is there third party waste heat available? Can we upgrade that heat to heat that's useful to us at a temperature that's useful to us in, the, in our structures? Um, can we do something with our low temperature heat recovery, try and make our systems as efficient as they possibly can be? Uh, and maybe think about uh, long and short term energy storage in more um, realistic terms than, than the dis dismissive nature that we have had over the previous uh, 10, 15, 20 years. As I say, I think uh, bioenergy has an important part to play. Um, a lot of people think this is transition only. Um, I think if we're wedded to the sorts of temperatures, flow temperatures that we're asking for, then bioenergy still has a, a, a long-term important part to play in the decarbonisation of our heat network. Um, but be aware it comes with this health warning, this environmental permitting issue to make sure that we're not um, causing air quality problems by trying to solve the carbon emissions problem somewhere else. Uh, and just sort of running towards the, sort of the end of this, is offsetting part of the equation? Well, uh, yes, it, of course it is, it has to be, um, because as I said at the outset, we can't consider that we will get to gross zero in terms of our carbon emissions. As part of our um, government's 10 point plan that they launched at around the tomato conference time last year, um, there was two aspects really, carbon capture and tree planting. These are the, the offsetting actions um, that the government are thinking about at the moment. Um, and carbon capture doesn't mean capturing that carbon and putting it into protective cropping to, to enrich the environment, area environments. We're talking about trying to lock that carbon up in the same way as tree planting is locking that carbon up. And these are the opportunities to, to, for us to offset our emissions actions. Uh, and just to prove that they've put their money where their mouth is, um, where they've started to put some funding into capturing CO2 um, and direct air capture here, sucking air through the uh, um, through these fans and throwing it out with less carbon associated with it, or more realistically, stuff like this, which is stripping CO2 out of flue gases from, from power stations. Uh, and so, yeah, in summary, um, yeah, what can you do right now? Well, you need to start to develop your strategies. Uh, and your strategies probably involve buying some green energy to start with, buying uh, offsets maybe if you need to make big actions very quickly, um, and then starting to think about how we might reduce our emissions um, by technological change and conceptual uh, and practical change on our nurseries. Um, and that, I think, is me. Thank you, John. Um, we have uh, snuck into the break a bit, but I am going to go ahead and ask a couple of questions anyway. Um, regarding carbon auditing, um, considering there doesn't seem to be, well, currently available tool that's suitable specifically for horticulture, how easily could we develop, develop a horticulture-specific carbon auditing tool? From an energy side, I think the, the carbon calculations are relatively simple and straightforward. Um, we're, we're multiplying two numbers together generally, which is the quantity of energy that we burn by its carbon emissions factor to give us our carbon emissions um, for that part of our business. Um, the development of the other the specific tools um, and specific um, calculations for protective cropping, I think, are a bit more involved. 
Um, and I think that's something that as an industry we need to, to work on and probably in the next sort of 12 months. And if we don't do it that quickly, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, I think we sort of get sidetracked for too long and don't do action quick enough. Um, but yeah, it's not gonna be easy um, as most of the tools are built around um, sort of traditional farming type practices. Um, and I'd welcome any being involved in any development of, uh, of a tool for protected cropping, I think. Yeah, there does seem to be a bit bit of a gap in the market there and an opportunity to um, develop something. Um, I will actually um, bring Dave Chandler back in for a moment. Um, I've got a question for you, Dave. What is the yep. rate of decline of non-native species by comparison to BTA? Um, so the rate of decline of, how do you, sorry, I don't really understand the question. So when you compare the rate of decline of the uh, of BTA oh. versus non-native, Oh, so you mean in terms of the life of the hive? So um, with um, non-natives, we know from experience, the numbers go up. So the, the numbers of bees in the hive go up over time and they're peaking at about eight weeks, whereas with the native bees, the numbers are going down. Thank you. Um, another question for Dave Chana. Um, are some growers already using artificial cooling for their bee colonies under um, hottest conditions? Yeah, so, so one of the suppliers has recommended um, cooling and I think there's a, there's a hive with a fan um, and there's, there's also conflicting advice given about where you actually um, need to put your, your hive um, and in different different elevations in the crop and what we're trying to do is actually generate the data because um until we can actually produce you know once we've got the data then we can um, provide advice based on the evidence and and at the moment um that data is not there in the public domain for the growers so i think what we're trying to do it is difficult but fundamentally we need to produce the evidence and the data and then we can um, adjust management practice based on that um, sorry realized i was muted then <laughs> yeah, yeah. um so from what you've learned so far obviously we've said that that you, you know your work your current continuing with this work this season um but do you have are there any interim recommendations for growers to kind of try and mitigate for the performance of the native bumblebee at the moment or it's too early to say it, it's too early to say i mean at the, so we you know we know that the suppliers are, are responding by putting more be more hives into the crop but we as i said we need to get the data and we need to get up what we're doing is difficult it's really hard and um because it's such a complex situation but we'll, we're moving towards getting the data so that then we can make firm recommendations. So we'll look forward to that um, hopefully towards the end of the year and early next year. Um, I think that's um, where I will pause for now.